That's it. Learning to trust him. You think it's easy, but it always isn't that easy. With all that's going on in the world, I do want you to know I did not get around to greet you. I am seeming to suffer from a cold that I thought was over with and isn't. Uh, So if I go a little slower this morning, uh, you will understand. But, um, and uh, so I stayed away from you. If you came up to me and you shook my hand, what can I say? (laughs) You got germs, okay? That's all I can tell you. All right, now I'm gonna be preaching on uh, Isaiah chapter 13, one, all the way to chapter 20, verse 18. But as is my custom, I am only going to read four verses in that area. And it is found on, uh, in Isaiah 14, verses 24 through 27. Isaiah 14, 24 through 27. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land and on my mountains trample him underfoot and his yoke shall depart from them and his burden from their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed concerning the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out Over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? This is the word of the Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's go to Him in prayer. Oh Lord, I am grateful that sometimes you show me even more clearly my weakness so that you might display your strength. I pray as we come to your word that we would be humbled, that we would realize who reigns over all nations, over all peoples, forever and ever. It is you. Now move by the power of your Holy Spirit and your servant. Keep him from error, but move in the hearts of your people. Let this good news that you reign give them greater courage less fear, that they can stand up against anything that comes against them in the power of the Holy Spirit. We do ask this in Jesus' name, amen Amen. and amen. You may be seated. All right, now you know where was, what chapter was Isaiah called to be a prophet? sixth, right? And the first five tells you why he was called based upon the condition of the people of God who gave themselves into sin. Then you've got to see, if you're looking at the whole of chapter one through chapter 39, you have to see chapters seven through 12 and chapters 36 through 39 as bookends. They're bookends in that grouping of those chapters. And why do I say bookends? Because it's all about trust. In the first chapters that I'm speaking of, chapters 7 through 12, it's about King Ahaz and how he did not trust the Lord and sought alliances with other nations to save him from the Assyrians. That didn't work, right? Because he didn't trust in God. 36 through 39 speaks of King Hezekiah who did trust in God and therefore God saved Jerusalem. It's all about trust. And so the chapters in between, God says, look, the first king failed the test. So now I'm going to tutor you on how you are to trust me. I'm going to show you in these chapters from 13 all the way through to uh, 35, I'm going to show you indeed how you are going to learn to trust me. All right? You got it? That's how uh, it is set up. And here's how to see it. He says, why trust the nations who are under God's judgment? Isaiah chapter 13 through Isaiah chapter 23. Why trust the nations when God controls history? Isaiah 
chapter 24, verses 1 all the way to chapter 27, 24 through 27. Why trust those who foolishly tell you to trust in flesh and blood rather than the spirit of God? Chapters 28 through 35. You see, trusting in God is the only way the Davidic dynasty is going to last, right? It's the only way that Israel, Judah, in this case, is going to survive. And anyone else who hopes to survive must trust in the Lord. Amen? You want to survive in this life? Hello? You want to survive in this life? Do you want to uh, survive in the life to come? Then you got to trust in God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's what it's about. There it is. And so some people just struggle with this because they see God using the nations, stirring up the nations to punish other nations. And so they say, well, doesn't that rationalize brutality? In other words, if God can do it, why can't we, right? Be violent against people, take vengeance. Well, we read that today in the reading. Kim read it. It's in Romans 12, 19, that God said through the apostle Paul, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It goes all the way back. You see it in Genesis 4, right? When the blood of Abel cries out from the land to God. God is always hearing the innocent cry out to him who have been abused, right? And so he hears their cries and he brings his righteous justice to it. It's his righteous vengeance that keeps us from being violent. It keeps us from taking unrighteous vengeance, right? Why? I mean, that's the constant teaching in Isaiah. That's the constant teaching throughout scripture. What's the teaching? There's a day of reckoning. There's a day of reckoning when all people will stand before the judgment throne of God and have to give an account, right? See, that's what we have to see. And and, and in Isaiah and in the Old Testament, it's called the day of the Lord. In the New Testament, It's called the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The day is coming when all must give an account. I don't know, did I miss it? Matthew 25, isn't it Jesus Christ who judges the sheep and the goats, right? We have to trust in him. Let me try to bring it down as I do from history because remember the Bible is the word of God but it is also history. And uh, Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin killed millions of people. And they killed these people not because they were concerned about their nation or they were concerned about their people. They killed them because they wanted power. It was about power and having power over people. Friedrich Nietzsche, who some of you probably studied in school, hated Christianity. He hated Christianity because he said it feminized men. You know, he said that the, uh, it robbed them of their native aggression, impatience, cruelty, and discourtesy, and replaced it with such virtues of passivity, meekness, and sensitivity. He said, Christianity Christianity robs males of the one essential for greatness, the will to power. That's what they listened to. Now, here's the thing. Hitler, Adolf Hitler, committed suicide, right? Joseph Stalin died of a stroke, which some believe he was poisoned took him a little while to die from February the 28th, 1953, and he died on March 5th, 1953. But the point is, it seems they got away with it. They killed millions of people. And where's the justice? Right? Where's the justice for these men's crimes against 
so many. How many times have we said, it's not fair that people get away with that. It's not fair that governments get away with that, right? How many times have we said things like that or that organization gets away with that? That's not fair. There's a lot of that's in there, right? We say that. But how many times have I said before, and I'll say it again, no one gets away with anything because God reigns over the nations. He reigns over people and his justice will come. Huh? That's, that's the truth. And that's what we have to take hope in that he is a righteous judge and he will judge righteously. Now you may say, well, wait a second. You know, it seems like I got away with my sins, right? Because I'm going to heaven. Well, no, you didn't. Because those sins and the punishment of those sins had to fall on someone else. And his name is Jesus Christ. But do not miss this fact. All of us will be judged for how well we built on the one foundation of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and it says that all our works will go through fire, and the fire will reveal how well we built. Did we build, build with wood, hay, or straw, or did we build with gold or silver, right? So isn't, isn't that great that all the dirty tricks, all the broken promises, all the betrayals, all the dirty deals, all the unsolved murders will come to light. And it will not satisfy our justice, but his justice. And by the way, there's a big difference between those two. I want his justice to be satisfied. Amen? That's it. He reigns over the nations, over history, over flesh and blood. That's what Isaiah 14, 24 through 27 is making very clear. What the Lord has purposed will be accomplished and no one, no one can turn back his hand. All right, so let me break it down to you further because again, preach the text. Preach the text, right? So let me break it down. This whole section 13, 1 through 26. Isaiah shows God reigns over the nations through five representative examples. The first representative example is Babylon slash Assyria because Babylon was part of Assyria initially until the Chaldeans overtook the Assyrians with the Babylonian Empire. So you, a lot of times you'll see Babylon, Assyria. Okay, you, you're looking at me like, okay, whatever. You know, we got to have more people who love history. I, I, I just want to know. Okay. All right. I'll get you there at some point. All right. So you got that. Then you got Philistia, Moab, the Damascus and Israel alliance, or Aram, or Syria sometimes called, and Egypt. Five civilizations are then mentioned again in 21.1 through 23.18. So there's a total of 10 but we're only going to take five. So though Babylon starts out as part of Assyria, the Chaldeans take it over. They defeat the Assyrians by God's design and they're the ones who destroy Jerusalem in 586 BC. Uh, however, God honors people and the Babylonian empire is defeated by the Medes who are the Persians, All right? And so they defeat them. You see that in Isaiah 13, 17. It was prophesied before it ever happened. It didn't happen until 539 BC, but it's prophesied in Isaiah 13, 17 that the Medes would defeat the Babylonians. And it's through the Medes, the Medo-Persians, that Israel comes back to the land and builds the second temple. So Felicia is having a good time. The Philistines, you know. They're having a good time because they say, all right. The Davidic dynasty is over. They're going to get theirs. And so God says, not so fast. You are the ones who will be judged. And the Davidic throne will triumph. Then Moab, God says, well, why didn't you run to Zion? 
You knew that your hope was in Zion. Why didn't you run there? Oh, because of pride. Because of pride, they did not seek the place where they would have been protected, Zion. And so God says, therefore their pride saw to it that they, they were brought into contempt in spite of all his, all their uh, great multitude, multitude and those who remain will be very few and feeble. Then there is Ephraim, which is the 10 tribes of Israel. They thought they could find safety by having an alliance with Aram. And God says, guess what? You're both going to be destroyed huh? because of your sin. Because there is no security in political alliances. There's only security in trusting in the Lord our God. See, it, it works out in history. So that's it. Then you got uh, Egypt, which Cush, you'll see Cush because Cush took over Egypt. And Egypt is headed for disaster. But one day, now watch how God always brings it back to his grace. One day, Israel, Assyria, and Egypt will come to Zion as one world under one God. Isn't that something? You hear judgment, but you always get grace. That's our God, right? In fact, the whole purpose of the judgment is to open our eyes to the fact that we need grace. That's the point, right? So he shows that. In each case, God reigns over the nations is clearly seen. If Now look here. This is a verse I'll have you look at. Chapter 13, verse 11. Look there with me at that. Chapter 13, verse 11. Notice what God says in that verse. I will punish the world for its evil. Now notice, world. And the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Nobody gets away with anything. And then verse 13, skip down. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. You know, you always hear physical things happening in the earth when God is ready to judge nations. That's why you hear about, you know, the moon turning blood red and the sun black. It's not meant to be literal. It's meant to show you that God is about to move through nations and there's a lot of destruction that's going to come to the world through the punishment of those nations that affects the planet. See, that's the point, all right? You with me? See, I'm trying to teach. Now, here's the thing. Revelation 14, 18, you hear about Babylon again, right? But in historical context, that refers to Rome. But here's the thing. If you look at all of scripture, Babylon is the world system. It is the vast world system. And you see that in Isaiah. You see that in all of scripture. You see that since the fall. You see that at the Tower of Babel. The world system is Babylon because it is always seeking to push God out that he doesn't exist, right? So God is saying to us that the end of this world, which is coming, amen, and its systems is as much deserved and is as real as the punishment, watch this, of these nations. Just as you see in Isaiah, the punishment of these nations, it will be the punishment of the whole world. Because I'm coming again, and all this madness is going to end. Huh? Isn't that good? You like that? I'm hearing amen him. How about over there? Nothing? You got nothing. Not an amen. Praise the Lord. Bob, you're on it. Keep going. Nothing. All right. All righty. Historically, no nation that has sought world domination has survived in all of history. Never happened. You know why? Because they don't reign. That's it. Come on. Now think of it this way. Let's say in 1942, when my father was preparing to jump at Normandy, a few years later, that somebody came up to somebody in Europe, 
somebody in the United States and said, in three years, Germany and Japan will be no more. They will fall. They w Nobody would have believed that. They thought they were all that in a bag of chips. Huh? Right? And then there was the Soviet Union. The Iron Curtain. Right? And then what happened? On June 12, 1987 in Berlin, Germany, when then President Reagan gave a speech, well... Right. Oh, he's got to tilt that head. Well, and he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Not only would the wall come down, right? On November 9th, 1989. And not only would there be the reunification of East and West Germany on October 3rd, 1990, but the Soviet Union would be no more. Those... Eastern Bloc, Eastern Europe countries would know freedom again because guess what? They don't reign over the nations. He judges the nations and none of them will endure except his holy nation. Amen? So you say, so what? So what? Okay, you gave us a history lesson. Big deal. Right? Big deal. Well, it comes from Isaiah, but when God's people trust in his power, his sovereignty, his rule, they can live above, above the madness. See, that's what it takes. It takes trust in God to live above the madness that is all around us. That means we can keep sharing the gospel in the midst of that madness. We can help the needy. We can help the distressed. Why? Because we know our God reigns and no one, no nation, no person can stop or defeat him. Therefore, in his name, we march on, right? That's why we sing that song, Onward Christian Soldiers, because we got nothing to fear. Huh? If God is with us, who can be against us? Isn't that, isn't that true? That's what it's about. We can be brave. We can be bold. Even in the midst of those nation's rulers and the wicked among them who puff out their chest. I had this all my life. I rule over you. You can eye to eye and you don't have to be an Italian New Yorker to do it. I die, my God reigns. My God reigns. Not you. Not your wickedness. No matter what power you may think you have over me or over the church or over the gospel, it is an illusion because you do not have it. Hello? Huh? It is like what Jesus says in John 19, 11 to Pontius Pilate, right? You remember that? You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. There might be a time we might have to say that in, in the eyes of someone else to say, even if they seek harm of us, you have no power over me unless it was given you from above. But here's another thing. That every time we see a historical crisis, and this is why I think history is important to learn, because you see what happens throughout the centuries, is that every time a historical crisis happens, see it as it may be the dawn of the day of the Lord. Huh? Like watching a coming soon, dare I say, of a movie of, a, of the second coming. Right? That's the way a lot of scholars in World War, during World War I and World War II saw it. This may be the dawn of the day of the Lord. And why is that important? Because it gives us confidence. It gives us hope that nothing can stop that day from coming, right? No matter how bleak it may look in our world, no matter how bleak it may look in our lives, nothing can stop the coming of Christ, the, that trumpet blast, huh? No matter the calamity all around us. And he will use the nations. He will use warriors to fulfill his purpose, to bring that day. 
Huh? Boy, I'm excited. During these times, we in Christ can be brave while others are fearful and, off, and we can offer them what? What Alec Motier said, the lifeboat. The lifeboat of the gospel. We can offer them because they're going to be being taken up with madness and feeling there is no hope. Well, who's going to give it to them? Us. Who preach the gospel, who live the gospel before them, who care for them, right? That's us. We're the ones who throw the lifesaver of salvation so that we may save at least some. Right? All right, so let's get to this. What's the sin? What's the sin of these nations? And you notice I said singular. Because really, if you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, you look at all of these things, nations throughout the world that God defeated, what was their sin? Pride. That's it, really, when you think of it. One sin, pride. Look at with me in chapter 16, verse 6, when it speaks of Moab. Moab. 16, 6. We have heard of the pride of Moab. How proud he is of his arrogance, his pride, and his insolence. In his idle boasting, he is not right. I like that phrase. He ain't right. And of course, now, look here. Chapter 14. You wanted me to say something about this, so I'm going to say something about it. Chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. This famous text is well known. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Now, some scholars, and this was true in the Middle Ages, it was also true a little later, and still today it is true, that many scholars, along with John Milton in Paradise Lost, believe that the O morning star or O, o day star was Satan. This was talking about before creation when one third of the angels went with Satan and against God. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. I, along with Calvin and Luther, disagree. This text is about the king of Babylon. He, how he raised himself. And you know about Nebuchadnezzar, right? God had to humble him. He had to start eating grass, right? Like, a, like an animal. You can use a Revelation 12. I can somewhat understand that because it says the red dragon will sweep a third of the stars and he'll be thrown down to the earth. You know that text, right? Revelation chapter 12. Okay, that, that may indeed, that sounds pretty much like Satan. Uh, but the term Lucifer is never used in scripture. So let's get that out. That is from the Latin Vulgate. And it's used in this text, but the interpreters of that text never meant Lucifer to be a proper name. His name is Satan. There's other things, dragon, you know, you know, all the other things, but not Lucifer. All right, so let's stop, let's stop using that, right? Okay. But it is clear who's behind pride. Satan, right? I mean, he's the one who was the one who was prideful when he rebelled against God. And the thing is, is we don't know that Revelation 12 is talking about before creation. Is it talking about during Jesus? Uh, day because Jesus said in Luke 10 18 I saw Satan fall like lightning to the earth is that what Revelation 12 is talking about or is it talking about a future time during a future tribulation I don't know I just think we can't be dogmatic about how many angels fell uh, with Satan and I think we we always you know I, I've already bust your bubble about angels don't sing right everybody got what angels don't sing well and I told you you can't be dogmatic about it but you know then what did we do we sang about seven seven songs about angels singing 
in the, okay. But we don't base our doctrine on songs or Christmas carols. We base them on the word of God. All right. Okay, I thought I'd get that out. I didn't plan on getting that out, but I just figured I'd get that out. Okay, so here is the point. Refusing to humble ourselves before God is the essence of sin and is the birthplace of wickedness. We fail to humble ourselves before the God who reigns over all. And that's where the problems Begin. Now look here, again, it's 16.6, but I want to compare chapter 16.6 to chapter 16.5. Now watch this. What are the words he uses for pride? He uses four words, pride, arrogance, insolence, and boasting. Now look at the verse just prior to it. It speaks of Jesus Christ coming and reigning. And what does he demonstrate? Steadfast love, faithfulness, justice, Righteousness. See, four and four. He counters those four with these. Isn't that beautiful? All right. So, and by, I do want to say this too, because of what Friedrich Nietzsche said, pride is not gender specific. Hello? It's not just men who have pride. Sorry, sisters in Christ, but you got pride too. Oh, and you boys and girls, you got pride too. In fact, all of us got pride. And the, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, somebody says, well, are you humble? Well, boy, if I say I'm humble, then I'm prideful. <laughs> right? I always think that's a catch, you know? So I, I try to uh, not, not get into that. Um, because Jesus said this in Luke 16, that often what people exalt is an abomination in the sight of God. Okay? So if pride is a way to survive in the world, then why did Jesus have to come and humble himself to die for us? Right? Philippians 2. Doesn't that show that God the Father exalts the humble and opposes the proud? Look, if you want to be an enemy of God, then make your religion self-worship. Make your religion self-worship. It's all about me. Hello. Right? You know, you can shout to the world all you want. I am somebody. And the world isn't listening. It gives you a deaf ear. Because everybody else is crying. I am somebody. But here's the thing. I am somebody because the Father in heaven made me somebody in Christ Jesus because I'm created in his image. If even the unbeliever would understand that, then they can cry all they want, I am somebody, but it's because God made me somebody because he created me in his image. Huh? So you can say all you want. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for making me somebody. Right? All right, so let me even be more specific on defining pride. Here's pride. If you come to my care group, you'll get this. And Jim's care group. I'm going to put Jim in there because he teaches well. Salvation by works is pride. Every other religion believes salvation by works. It's pride. Man wants to believe he can do something to save himself. Here's another statement that's pride. I could cope. No, you can't. Not without Jesus. Here's another one. I got to work through this for myself. Okay. Or this one. Look at how my children just walk with Jesus. But look at all these other children who don't. Right? Oh, my denomination is better. Boy, they're, they're good on doctrine. Woo, woo. Right? My church is better. My pastor is better. Let's pause there for a second. <laughs> well, I can somewhat see where you're coming. No, no, I'm just <laughs> right. You, you, you see, you see the issue, right? Um, look, the greatest gift that we can give our children is not to give them everything they desire, right? It's not to give them, uh, you know, unrealistic praise. 
That's not it. You want to give your children something, love them. Love them. And have the siblings love them. And teach them that they're loved by their heavenly father through Jesus Christ. That's how they're loved. Right? And that they are somebody through him. That's what's important. That they know that they can do all things through Christ who strengthens them. That's what I want to hear from my children that, and, and from your children that if they did something well, I did it because Christ was working through me to do that, right? That, that's it. <sighs> Here's another thing Alec Motier says pride is. Pride is you don't have time to read the Bible. Pride is you don't have time to pray. That's pride. Pride is we've chose stubbornness over being kind, digging our heels in over reason. It is seen in who and or what we trust in rather than God. Who or what do we trust in to give us security, right? With whom do we do business with? With whom do we have relationships with? With whom do we love or build a loving, fall in love with? Right? Isaiah 55 puts this way. Pride labors on what does not satisfy. Pride says, I am the ultimate. Not God is the ultimate. That's pride. Every day we must surrender our own will for his will. Through the power and being able to do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot control your health. I cannot control my health. I know my wife keeps saying organic, organic, and I keep trying to eat it. Yes, okay, right. You can, but you can't control your health, you can't control your wealth, you can't control your family in the ultimate sense, or even your future. God controls that, right? In fact, it's insane to believe anything else. If you actually believe that you can control things, woo-woo, that ain't right. Amen? So let me end here. Isaiah gives the solution to pride. Chapter 17, verses 7 through 8. Look there with me. In that day, man will look to his maker, and his eyes will look on the Holy One of Israel. Now watch this. He will not look to the altars, the work of his hands, and he will not look on what his own fingers have made, either the asherim or the altars of incense. What God is saying is, it is not Washington. It is not London. It is not Moscow. It is not China, right? That controls your future. It, it is not them who make the ultimate decisions. God does. And we got to get with that. Because one thing I read, and it's, it ain't coming from me, it's coming from some of these other scholars I read. It's like, so often, the issue is we trust more in America that America can save us, or is our hope, rather than God himself. America does, uh, doesn't make any ultimate decisions for what's going to happen according to what God has set in plan. Therefore, look to him. Trust him. Put your hope in him. No matter what you lose to gain Christ... You'll forget about that. All you'll see is what you've gained because you've come to Christ. Huh? That's what uh, 1 John 5, 4 says. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Because I'm teaching on cults, this is the last thing I want to say about Christianity. Christianity is the most inclusive religion, faith of any. How do I know that? Because he says, well, Egypt is going to become uh, Zion. Assyria is coming to Zion. Israel is coming to Zion. All the nations of the world are coming to Zion and are going to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That sounds pretty inclusive to me. Right? But to achieve it, it is the most exclusive. It is the most exclusive. Right? Right? To, to get 
what he says in 1925, blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inherent inheritance. It is the most exclusive. Each of these people have to come to God according to God's way and not their own. John Oswald uses this illustration that I'll leave you with. It is like electricity, right? Electricity can be of great benefit if you handle it its way. Because if you don't handle it its way, you're gonna die. Right? See? So it, you have to come to electricity based on its terms or you die. Does that mean that electricity only gives advantage to certain people? No. Electricity will bless anyone who wants to use electricity, right? So long as you remember that you have to come on its terms. Is electricity a curse? No. Unless the way you deal with it, right? You got to relate to it. God says he cannot come in our midst because we are sinful and he is holy, right? But he has made a way for us to come into his midst, right? And the way to do that is through Jesus Christ. We either come his way or we die. Eternal death. I don't see what the issue is. He's the one who makes the rules because he's the only one who's holy. And if we want to come into his presence, this is the way he said, yeah, look, if a, if a young boy was running and ready to take a live electrical wire into his hands while standing in a puddle, wouldn't you run to that boy and try to push him out of the puddle to save his life? You wouldn't, have, you wouldn't accept or nobody would say to you, oh, how cruel you are to really tackle that young boy. Oh, you are so intolerant. How could you do such a thing? But when it comes to Christianity, then they say we're intolerant. We're the most inclusive, but it comes through a very exclusive means. And that is by repenting and believing and turning in faith to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Just as Egypt could not save Judah, right? Just as uh, Aram could not save Ephraim, America cannot save us. Not its economy, not its ingenuity, not its work ethic. What saves us is Jesus Christ. What appear, uh, prepares us for the end is Jesus Christ. That should give us enormous boldness to evangelize with joy and eagerness so others learn to trust in Jesus so their faith overcomes the world and not the world, their faith. Let's pray. Father God, we love Isaiah. Thank you for reminding us through this prophet who's in charge. For sometimes we forget and we trust in nations and people who do not make the ultimate decisions. Thank you for reigning. And then thank you for seeing to it that we will reign with you. In Jesus' name, amen.